everyone. Welcome to Sick Podcast. Uh, I'm Jordan. That's Joe. Joe's VP of Engineering. Worked at Google, Facebook, you name it. I worked at M&A uh, at Google. From a Googler's perspective, what's going on with these layoffs? Then we're going to go into Apple's new language model. Then we're going to hit research. And then we got uh, people's questions. So like, support, share. Google cuts hundreds of jobs across engineering hardware teams. Google cuts several hundred jobs across the company late Wednesday night as it continues to push for efficiency, a spokesperson confirmed. The layoff will impact employees in Google, central engineering, hardware, assistant team. The announcement marks the latest cost-cutting effort at Google as it works to rein in the dramatic growth that took place during the pandemic. Um, a lot of thoughts. So I have a lot of friends right now who are, who are losing work. If, um, I'm on, if you go to LinkedIn, it's just it's sad right now. Bummer. And thoughts, we're, we're here for you. And also, but I want to be real and I also want to call some people out. I see a lot of people on fucking LinkedIn who are like, um, I'm here. If anyone needs anything, I can help you out. And I've had my friends reach out to them and they've either been ghosted or the person basically says, I don't want to help. Wow. If you are that That's person, harsh. you are an asshole. Yeah. And we're going to find out who you are and you're going to get what's coming to you. Like It's like you're synthetic gonna get, and yeah. empathy. Empathy. And what you're going to get coming to you is not physical harm or hurt or anything, but when you need something and ah. you ask people what's going to happen is karma is going to follow you. And I'm a firm believer in it. I'm not, not going to go feng shui and everything, but <laughs> there are things in life that you can't control. You can't control you're making sickness. a list and checking it twice. Checking it twice. Like my mother, she couldn't control ovarian cancer. It happened to her. God rest her soul. God bless. And things like that. But there are things that you can control, which my mother showed me, that when she was still dying of ovarian cancer, had chemo, was dealing with uh, drug uh, drug withdrawals. She was still nice to people, helpful to people, and she spread a lot of love. And when she passed away, the priest in our community said, I've never seen the church so packed before. We had to open the doors because there were so many people there. Um, I have been to a, rich, a couple of rich people's funerals where people came for their wallets. When I went to my mother's funeral, people came for their hearts. So you do reap what you sow. Now, going to people who just lost, lost your jobs, we have an article. I had a former HR VP at Google write about what to do when you get laid off. I want you to read that. We'll have a link in the show notes. Second thing, number one, number one, this has nothing to do with you. You, If you got into Google, you're top tier, like full stop. Like some people say, well, some who are better than others. If you got into Google, you can produce and you can work. Now, when you get into the company, yeah, you're working with Joe Ternaski. Like, yeah, I'm a freaking idiot compared to Joe, but I was able to get into Google, which means I can at least work in other places. So you're awesome. Uh, second, this was an executive F up. Not anything to do with you. Executive mismanagement. They could not reassign you to the right orgs because they can't get their shit together. And I hope recruiters are feasting on this right now and reaching out. Like, if I had a recruiting team, I'd be like, Look, hashtag layoff Google. You see anyone say I got laid off, you reach them out now. Go, go, go. We're getting up at 7 a.m. We're going to 8 o'clock at night. We might do weekends. We're just getting things out because we want to close these people. Um, Don't you feel like that part's kind of amazing, like that the company can't find other projects that need good people? No, it, it's, it's terrible. And, you know, they do. Hey, they have a thing called a Google Jobs Bank. So now me and Joe are letting you guys in the inside. So one point, there's a name, guy named Salazar. Salzar, who ran YouTube, who ran YouTube for a minute before Salazar, and, and, yeah. before Susan Wojcicki took it. Yeah, guy's a baller, did a good job. But Susan, she was the one back in the day who said, let's go buy YouTube. So that was always her thing, but she didn't run it. But then eventually mm -hmm. she's like, you know, Larry, I want to run it. And mm -hmm. so Larry was like, well, I could be a douche and do what most corporations do. Go to Salazar and be like, you're not performing here and here and here and people don't like you. No, Larry said, look, Susan wants this. You've been working a very hard time in this. You grow us, grew us tremendously. But like, I want to still keep you on the payroll what you're getting paid. Would it be cool if I just put you on the bench where you could still get the same salary, but you just hang out with your family? And he's like, mm, sounds good to me. <laughs> so he, Google had so many rock stars sitting on yeah. the bench. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So the, the bench is for the top 1%. For the plebs like myself and everything, you get a severance package, which is still mm -hmm. like, they'll give you multiple months of pay. They might give you equity. They might give you full health care. Like that's that's pretty damn sweet. Most companies are like, you get a week of salary. Good luck. So, but still, let's go back to people we're talking to. You just got laid off. It's not about you. Second thing now, this is all a numbers game. I know a lot of good people who've been laid off before. And they're like, Jordan, I just like can't find anything. Is it to me? This is probably the first time people are facing in their work careers a kind of a tech recession. 
like uh, my dad was telling me, like when he started up his construction contracting business back in the seventies, mm-hmm. IBM used to be considered a lifetime job. You hired at mm-hmm. IBM, you stay there for life. Yeah, and then they started doing layoffs in the seventies and eighties. Um, my, they got to the point though for layoffs that IBM was known as like the Google of benefits and the stuff they would give to their employees. Um, my dad had a contract to help build homes in San Jose for IBM employees. IBM would build homes for their employees, like yep. and finance it for you. And then there's a credit union called Merriwest Credit Union that I'm part of, member of, and I hate Wells Fargo. I have a story about how we actually Wells Fargo owed my company, owed my family eighty thousand no. dollars, and how we took them to court. Um, I'll probably do a private video for our Patreon members to explain how that all goes. So patreon.com forward slash sick. Um, so this when Gary was trying to claim the stagecoach. Don't get you, Joe. Just that's Patreon. That's okay. So Joe's new here, you know. And no, no, there's more of the story, but yeah, okay, yes, that's part of the story. Uh, I'll tell you though. Do we get the stagecoach? Is the stagecoach at my house right now? You won't know if, until you go to patreoncom Svick and support us. So, well, what I was getting at was, I mean, was huge, and then the layoffs started happening. Gary had stories of unfortunately engineers ending their lives. They couldn't comprehend that this was happening. That was one slowdown. Um, there were slowdowns during the uh, dot com bust. Uh, during the real estate crisis, Google had their first mini layoff reorganization in the sales side of um, selling ads to real estate companies and banking because they all went tits up. Um, but other than that, there's no engineers' job loss. It was only until we had this post COVID um, tech recession. That was the first time people saw layoffs. So you could have people who worked their whole entire careers in tech, and this is the first time they saw a slowdown. And they're like, oh, like this is possible? It's like, yeah, it's possible. Everything's cyclical in business. That's the way it goes, and it's unfortunate. Um, so that being said now, there's a lot more great talent on the market, but there's a lot less top-tier people hiring at that pay rate or at that level. And it does not mean that you need to like go into negotiation and be like, I'm going to work for $10 and a, a, a Wendy's meal ticket or some shit or gift card. It just means that it's a more difficult market. And what you need to do is when you're looking for jobs, be sweep the leg, no mercy, be an assassin. You need to send direct messages to people on LinkedIn with, hi, I saw uh, this job opportunity, link job opportunity. Could you please refer me? Here's my resume. And then also I'm including, so you can copy and paste my name, email, phone number, and a blurb written on your behalf about me that you can just copy and paste into the referral box mm. at work. Nice. That's your, that's 90% of the work right there. You've done Yeah. the other 10%. Like, Make yes, it people have to, for them to recommend yeah. you. Right. And yes, people, my people want people to do it right away. Like, believe me, I'm not perfect. I get a lot of referral requests to try to hit as many as I can, but like my dad got sick during break work gets crazy. Things happen, but you know, so anyways, that makes it easy, but also, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't be like Luke going down the valley of the freaking Death Star and shooting the one torpedo into the shaft. That that's very it's high 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 uh, high odds of failure. Instead, you got to scatter shoot that that stuff. Like you got to be considering it like you're going to a dating app. Like you swipe right on as most stuff you possibly can, <laughs> most things you see, and you hope maybe something lands and it might get you to an inter- uh, into an interview, and then you go from there. So cut all the bullshit, cut all the crap now. That recommendation assumed that you knew the person who had a job. Now, let's say you knew a person who knows another person that might be hiring. You sent another template saying, hey, I see that you know Doug. Um, Doug has an open position at, at – or a company has a certain open position here linked to the position. Would you be willing to recommend me? Also, here's a canned message you can send to Doug, in which basically it's now you're writing a message to the person you're asking uh, on their behalf to see if Doug or a referral. So you make it so that they can easily cut and paste stuff. So you just make it super easy. And people are like, oh, this is like, everyone knows this. No, no dog. I get people who reach out to me and they're like, hey, let's go have a coffee. Let's go have a chat. And I'm like, I, we didn't really have a relationship. And I know, I just saw you got laid off. And I know, just just be real with me. Just be real and just be like, I need a job. I respect that more. So just come out and say that. So anyways, I'm done ranting. Um, Joe, uh, could you talk about like, why did this layoff take so long? Like, we had Bard came out like a year ago. That shit should have been plugged into Google Assistant like immediately. This team should have been reorganized. They should, they should have told everyone on the team, like, we're going to obviously pipe Bard in because the current assistant was good before Bard. But now Bard, even though it sucks compared to JetGPT, is better than what Google had. So obviously it's going to happen. We're just letting you all know that you probably should stop on your projects 
you need to start interviewing now. We're giving you a year or so just to move around the org mm. and look. Um, maybe they did that internally. Maybe they didn't. But anyways, how come it took so long for them to g- at least get to the situation where like, now they're finally like, okay, let's get, let's get, let's, we got to move on. Yeah. And you could ask the same question uh, probably at Apple with Siri or at, at Amazon with the Echo, I guess, Alexa. Um, I'm sure all of these teams had their goals and they were heads down executing and trying to hit some schedule and trying to you know, get some features out against their competitors. I mean, these products have kind of been stuck in a rut for a while now. I don't think anyone's that excited about the existing assistant, you know, assistant hardware products. Uh, And so my guess is they were mostly just trying to focus on their own timelines and their own product plans. But you have to kind of look at what they were doing and say to yourself, even if you weren't planning to adopt the new stuff that was happening with Uh, language models, didn't you expect that your competition would? I mean, if I was working on Google Home, I would just assume that Amazon and Apple were going to scrap their old uh, hard-coded task-based systems, and they were going to rebuild something based on a language model just because they could, and and, and I'm paranoid, I would assume my competition would do it to me. So then my immediate next question would be, well, if they're going to do that to us, why shouldn't we do it to ourselves first? Which is always the question you should be asking. You know, is there some way to disrupt what we're doing? And if there is, can we do it before somebody else does it? And failing that, I'm guessing the teams were fairly locked into their plans. And now someone higher up at Google has decided to do it to them. And the mm. sad part to me is mm. the way they're doing it seems to be let's clean house lose the people who were in those teams and then we'll restaff it with some other teams. And my reaction to that is why couldn't you repurpose the people you had there? Now, when you and I were at Google, we lived through this similar kind of disruption that happened in translation models. And you probably remember there was a a fairly successful translation model that required lots of hand coding to do special cases between one language and another especially where the languages were very different. And there were engineers who specialized in writing these rules that would, that would hand translate from one case to another. And this was before la- large language models were a thing. And when the large language models appeared, all of that code became obsolete. I mean, thousands and thou- thousands of man hours or whatever of, of hand coded special case rules for translating between languages was all thrown out and it's been replaced by large language models that can translate between many languages in a fairly fluent way and don't require hand coding of special case rules. In fact, you'd much rather find examples where the model doesn't do that well and put that into the training set for the next version of the model, right? So the rules of the game have changed utterly. And I don't know if any of the engineers involved in the old style of building that thing got laid off or if they were just repurposed. Hopefully they were all repurposed because they were very talented. And what I'm kind of confused about is why companies don't take that approach more often unless they're just stuck in a cost cu- a pure cost cutting situation, which I don't think is true for Google. Really good point. Like here. Hear- Everyone says here, I think about what Joe said in the comment section, what I said too. Um, I should have had, you also should have had here, Tara Pram. She was an HR VP at Google and then became an HR VP at GE. She's fantastic. She probably could have went deeper into this whole entire thing. Um, I I completely agree with you. Um, and also, this is one comment that I've been hammering home. Me and Joe have our own like hobby horses on things. Joe's very pro-fractional shares. Um, there's a joke on the side. Because I used to tell, Joe was saying on our WhatsApp group, like, hey, why are they doing a share split? I'm like, well, you know, it's like they do a share split and like makes it look cheaper. People can get in. And Joe's like, what about fractional shares? And then I tried to like explain longer. And then Joe responds, what about fractional shares? And he kept on, he kept on doing it. And then eventually, I think I posted that Simpsons meme of when uh, Homer is crusty and he's attacking the Hamburglar. And the kid's like, mm-hmm. stop, stop. He's already dead. Jordan, stop it. Just stop saying anything. Joe's beating you. Um, so one of my hobby horses is yes. The Ilya Sus- Suskebergs, the Nikola Teslas, the people who in- do the technical innovation, like 
that's huge. And that's a major, major important fact. And I agree with it. But you need the other half, which is the people who do the last mile integration and get the innovation into people's hands. And that is equally different. Oh, oh Jordan, oh, you know, like these language models, like how important, how tough this was. And yeah, we could go back into like the 1960s and 50s and how the ideas were kind of out already for like neural nets and people were thinking about it. And Ilya like took the risk and did it. But like getting that technology in people's hands, like Elon didn't invent the electric car. But he had to invent the whole entire machinery to get the electric car into your hands. And that was, one could argue, much harder than inventing the electric car. So I see with Google Assistant and everything, going to your point, um, one thing that me and Joe try to practice all the time is when, wherever we work, we're always thinking of like, okay, what's coming down the corner that might disrupt what we're doing? If it looks like there's a chance of doing it, let's study it deeply and know that technology inside and out, the pluses and minuses, and not try to analyze it from our own institutional biases and laziness. Institutional biases and laziness means me and Joe have built an internal process at our company that works well for our goals so we can check in at 11 o'clock in the morning at work and check out by 2 p.m. and we're good and collect our check. Um, seeing it from the outside and saying, hey, if I'm a customer with all the flaws this new idea has – would I be willing to pay for this thing because it really serves certain needs that me and Joe are not offering for our current product? If that is the case, then we need to wake the hell up and we need to figure out a way to integrate it. So yeah, your customers I, could, could abandon you, but also your competitors could undercut you. They could come out with mm -hmm. something that's much cheaper, much better, whatever. I think the original reference in this space is probably uh, the Andy Grove, only the parent, only the paranoid survive. survive. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a classic and, you know, from the back in the days of the semiconductor industry, but I think it applies even more to software products. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's totally because I mean, just think about the life expectancy on any software product. Like it's just like na nanoseconds. Like, I mean, you think about like MySpace yeah. was the thing in the early 2000s, couldn't be stopped. And then in the nanosecond, Facebook came out. Facebook was the thing. And now it's TikTok is going to destroy Facebook. It's going to destroy Snapchat. Some of that's overhyped, but it made sure made Facebook move quickly because they thought that someone was going to eat their lunch. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. you have to have in the back of your mind. But it's, what's really interesting is as companies get bigger, they get rid of the people who are out there in the market, the technologists who love tech for the sake of tech, want to experiment. And they start hiring more of the operationalizers, the, the Tim, Tim Apple, Tim Cook type people who are good at getting someone who already made something brilliant and just squeezing out the next nth percentile of efficiency gain which is good if there's still some space. But then once you start hitting the top, like you're really seeing right now that we're seeing some buyer fatigue on new iPhones. Like there's always going to be a market mm. for iPhones. But the question is though, is the marginal, the improvement from the first generation iPhone to the second was a pretty big step up, I, I imagine. But then if you look at from the 13 to 14 to 15 iPhones, it's pretty effing marginal. Like they're not like, we invented AGI from 13 to 14. Like you have to get this. This is more of like, look at this bezel finish. Look, oh, we no, have another the bezel finish. The bezel yeah. finish. We have another camera and a the pop of color. A pop of color. God, Joe, when I used to be your admin, I'd sit in these VP of product demoing new products and selling them to customers. Like I wanted to just like, uh, so, so uh, and because it's happening, Tim Apple now is in a really tough spot because he's just trying to squeeze more and more. But the market is moving and changing. It doesn't mean apples are going away. It just means their margin, they're going to have margin compression. Yeah. And that's well, the, very the tough for them. Of this is why people are so excited about SaaS businesses, right? Mm -hmm. they, they get on that morphine drip of monthly per seat revenue. Yeah. And they just, they're constantly getting new money every month on a very steady cadence. And so they can predict their revenue out several years and say, here's our growth rate. Here's this money coming in. And it's all very predictable and safe and you can give good quarterly statements to your investors. So, you know, as long as the margins are good, you're happy. Uh, I think for people like you, you were mentioning like Apple, I'm, I'm guessing the same is true for Samsung uh, producing the galaxy. But anyway, for the cell phone providers, if there's not some major improvement that makes you have to upgrade, they just don't sell new devices. Yeah. No, that's so that's it's really true. So, um, Excellent points there. Um, here's a question now. I have Google Homes all over my fucking house. When 
will I get barred in there, Joe? Like my, my dad now. Because so here's a here's a trick. The yeah, only I heard reason I got Gemini poop, Ultra was coming soon. I heard Gemini Ultra was coming. We need a do 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 do. As I recall, you will pay extra for Gemini Ultra. That's my oh, guess. Dude, that's bullshit. That You're being said, Gemini, what is it? Gemini Pro, the middle of the road model. I don't know. It was just there's two. That's what you're going to get on a Google like Home, just, right? Yeah. yeah, you're just going to get also, something the, kind of middle of the road, and you're going to have high well, latency because it's going to be running on the server side. Well, I remember Sundar said in like a their last IO, who was like, "We're going to have a Kit Kat Jelly Bean." So these cute little names for like their locally run models that'll be on your cell phone. So mm-hmm. I'm wondering if they're going to do where the fuck that is and put it on the local. Your local I don't local think Mindy's. the home device has the hardware to run. Right, even doesn't the, have memory. I don't think it has to the memory and shit, right? It doesn't it's have the memory. Run. I mean, they were horsepower. designed to be yeah. really cheap, right? Yeah. They were sold at low That's cost. That's true because it's like 29 bucks. Yeah. I think you're better off there taking, I mean, this is kind of funny, but reusing an old mobile phone and you know, just using it for that kind of Google Home use case. That's true. Because like, I never had the Google Home until they did one tech demo and said, now you can put it around your house and you can do broadcast from like home to home. So for OGs who remember the show, will remember all of a sudden they'll, they'll hear, Bloop, Jordan, get me some coffee. It's my old man. That's right. And so he uses it all the time. Now, here's another funny thing. Last year, I started showing him ChatGPT and I started showing him what you could do and the audio aspect. And then now Microsoft's Copilot shows up on your Windows desktop. Mm-hmm. for his computer mm-hmm. and he now is like to me he's like well i just could say whatever in broken language and this co-pilot thing understands me why doesn't google home do that <laughs> and i'm mm-hmm. like you're right let me get sundar sundar <laughs> sundar okay actually speaking of that let's do some 2024 predictions Uh-oh. um i'm just gonna put it out there i think this is this is last year of sundar i think he's gonna be gone by the end of the year and here's some of my predictions uh why mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, average CEO of Fortune 500 company it stays around for four four point five years. Sundar has been at the head at the helm since like 20, 2015, 2016. Sundar is, um, we're, I'm gonna say we're homie. Oh, I know Sundar, but when I was your admin, I was always getting my shit. Into, like just what I was like a, uh, I was like a country yokel, like Forrest Gump, <laughs> like in my overalls, like wow, like, this is Google, wow. yeah. and I would go around with my badge just exploring the campus. <laughs> Because when you're an admin at Google, it's like 60% is like work and the other 40% is inner admin conflict and drama. And it was mm. always drama and people would bring their drama and I'd be like, I don't know. What do you think about your drama? And then I would just go back to like, maybe I'll go invest in real estate or I'll go walk around. And, I don't know. Talk to Vince Cerf. Maybe I'll talk to Vince Cerf, the guy who like created the internet. The architect. Or, or maybe we'll just do, talk about drama or maybe I'll learn app script. And when I get stuck, the guy who's on the JavaScript governing board council Oh my who God. also works at Google. We will go talk to him and he can teach me, which he did teach me things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would just go around badging. And then one day uh, I saw Sundar and he was like holding his wrist like this. And he was like, ah. And I was like, I got you, man. I'll open the door for you. He was like, hey, thanks. I'm like, hi, I'm George. Like, oh, I'm Sundar. I'm like your senior VP. <laughs> I'm like, mm-hmm. my overalls. Oh, really? Wow. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I spit a platoon because I'm a hillbilly. Yep. And I'm like, what's wrong with your wrist, buddy? He's like, oh, I got like carpal tunnel or something and i'm like oh dude i had the same thing too but let me get you some stretches so i went printed out stretches for him and gave them to him and then in the meetings i would see him like do the stretches and shit i was like hell yes oh, and then no. it got got better for him and then another time he ended up um uh i was trying to do a town hall in india for like raul and piyush or something uh shout out piyush great guy uh and i was organizing it late and piyush is hilarious because piyush is like a mover and shaker like he's like yeah i'm a director but I want everyone to know who I am. And mm-hmm. he told me like off cuff, like, oh, yeah, town hall, Sundar is probably going to show up. And this is when Sundar was the SVP. And S- Sundar pings me like nine o'clock at night. and was like, hey, uh, how you doing? I'm like, hi, Sundar. <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, uh, can you like give me a link to this like town hall? I, I don't know what I'm doing to connect to this thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's Google Meet sucks. I, I get you. So I gave him a link and I connected them and whatnot. He's like, thank you. And I was like, how are your wrists and whatnot? So, yes, that was my only story. Anyways, nice. so I'll stop. That being said, I think he's a super nice guy. I think he's a good human being. Uh, I think he's a fantastic peacetime CEO. There's a peacetime CEO and wartime CEO. Uh, I was wondering CEO. if you were going to say that. Of course. I got to say, ding. He's a wonderful peacetime CEO. He's like a Tim Apple. You, he, he focuses more on – so people who are non-founders who started companies early don't have equity stake in the company to be able to allow them to say, well, I own 50, 50% of the cap table, so go, go jump in a lake. 
I don't agree with what you say. If you don't like it, then go jump in another lake. Um, and not you know you don't do that, but it's always in the back of people's mind of like who really runs this company, you know? And and so for him, he never had that 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 stake. So the way for him to be successful at Google was he had to build relationships, become yes. friends with everyone. And, and he now was really he, good at it. Very good at doing it. And people forget the story about how he became CEO. Um, there was Marissa Mayer who went on to Yahoo. <laughs> Uh, who tried to make a power pick a, pick a power play for the CEO, the the Game of Thrones, the Golden? She, she wanted to lead. She wanted to sit on the Iron Throne and run Google. Oh, no. And Larry is like, I'm just here for technology and like AGI, but whatever. And she tried to make her play, and then Larry and crew was like, "But you're not like really a technologist like Sundar is. Sundar like knows the stack, knows like product." Has better relationships. If you more like than that, more. Sundar was able to get everyone to cooperate with mm -hmm. whatever Larry's crazy scheme was. Right. Tell me more about that. I mean, they would go into these meetings and Larry would be mumbling about something and everyone would leave the meeting and be like, what is Larry talking about? He's crazy. We can't possibly do that. Doesn't match our strategic plans and God knows what else. And then Sundar would classically say, what Larry means is, and he would explain it to them one by one what their part was, how Larry wanted it to come together. And so from their perspective, he was helping them be successful. From Larry's perspective, he was getting all these different teams to cooperate. Mm -hmm. He you was, know, he was massive a massive organization. That's the challenge. Yeah, he was a horse whisperer because he was a Larry whisperer, the executive whisperer. And, and I think he, he, even today, probably the bulk of his time is just smoothing over differences between different parts of the company, different senior executives. Mm -hmm. I do, he's, he's an excellent peacemaker. He's yeah. great. And that's why yeah. I um, appreciate about him. Now, he's going into wartime now. And that's where it's really tough because... Well, also think ahead. about when he first took over, the issue of the day was long-term integration of the Android platform with Chrome. How were these two things going to come together, right? That was the topic of the day. Yeah. To this day, never has are not integrated in any way. No, and this ties to what you said, is that if you look at a product, like if you look at Chrome, you look at your Android phone, and you see how it's like maybe not fully integrated, what's going <laughs> on is what's going on is Google is shipping their org structure. Mm -hmm. So what he had to deal with was, I think Andy Rubin was still there, and sun sets and rises on android and mm -hmm. that's what's that's what acquired founders should do you dig in and you fight for you what you the company paid a lot of money for mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and then we also built chrome internally and mm -hmm. people forget see back in my day their internet explorer used to be a piece of shit and it used to clog all your resources it was full of bloat back in my day and then google <laughs> said we're going to create now a streamlined browser that. that's barely going to use any ram that's it's right. going to be great it's going to be fast and lean and fast, minimal fast as Mozilla. and then we built it and everyone loved it and it exploded. It became huge. And so that yep. built a fief that built a fiefdom. Mm -hmm. And so these both fiefdoms are like, no, the sun sets and rises on Android. No, it sets and rises Don't on you Chrome. Remember Sundar trying to explain our long term strategy for how we were going to integrate these things. I remember him I trying to move those teams over and explain to those feisty senior VPs what it was going to mean and how it was going to happen. And honestly, none of it's happened. I mean, it's all just dragged on to this day. So his entire nine years, that problem has been uh, at the forefront and not addressed in any meaningful way from the customer perspective. And let's talk about the and problem. Eventually, mean, those things will become obsolete and no one will care. That's true. Sorry. Uh, let's go back. What would the ideal solution be? You had a magic wand and you're, you're 10 years ago. Uh, Android experience is different in Chrome, Chrome different than Android. How do we get it so that people are on a Chrome desktop? doing stuff they can instantly slide to their cell phone and still be doing with it was that what they wanted what was this what was the vision you think it should have been i i think what people really wanted is that the user experience between chrome and android would have a lot more in common such mm -hmm. that if i was using my android device and then i switched to the chrome uh, browser on a desktop machine yeah. i would feel like i was using a similar i was working with a similar set of ideas and that ideally an Android application would show up as a tab in the Chrome browser and vice versa. So I would mm -hmm. feel like the same components were running for me. And then lastly, and I think only, only Apple's really moved on these ideas,
But lastly, if I was doing something on my Android device, like listening to a certain piece of music or a podcast or, or editing something, whatever I was doing, and then I switched over to Chrome on my desktop, that, that activity would carry on. I would pick up where I left off yeah, and keep working on it. No, and, that makes sense. And right now, none of that's true. No, it's really weird too because the our I remember our selling point. Remember, do you remember? Was it? I don't say Andy Grove. Remember Andy? Your he was a senior manager under you, manager. Yeah. Engineering. Yeah. He was a good dude. He used to tell me, like, I don't know our marketing team doesn't understand how to market this product. It basically should be that for Google Docs, like you work on your working on your desktop, and then oh no, you got to go pick up the kids. So you open up your cell phone. Now you're on Docs, and you can still type your document. Like right, you are marketing. Describe the idea that Apple uh, branded as continuity. Yeah, and he was all, all over that. And our marketing team was like, "No, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to a marketing team um, who's just gonna make one of those soulless commercials that you could basically just take away the Google brand and logo and put in Microsoft, and yep. no one could tell the difference." So Andy yeah, and just continued to code. And, do and honestly, if you go back, you know, <laughs> over that nine year tenure, and you look at what Google Docs. Uh, sheets, slides, et cetera, was back then. Is it materially different or better now? No. I don't Such think anything's lead. happened. And Only Android and Chrome, they're essentially just as separate as they were back then. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Only thing we saw happen was like, we rightfully had uh, docs, sheets, slides, all separate apps. And then someone was like, no, we got to bundle it all together. Just, we just got, we just got to do it. We were talking about the the rabbit uh, device yesterday. Yeah, and you know, th God knows where it's going to end up or how successful it's going to be. But that company at least has an aggressive idea about where the user experience is going, and if they succeed, uh, whether they whether they succeed in promoting their device or they succeed in driving the industry, and someone else wins, but with a similar set of ideas. Uh, that is a only the paranoid survive kind of move. I mean, those mm -hmm. rabbit guys are at least trying to disrupt the user experience of mobile phones and desktops. And I hope so. And I hope like they're able to get such a lead that they get like at least a, a degree of hardcore followers who are willing to support it and make it so they can carve out some type of niche to stay alive and to continually to poke like what's going on like right now yeah. on my cell phone. Like I get comments from sick people who are, or uh, the podcast people and I should, this thing should be doing stuff for me. Like, Hey, he's currently in the podcast right now, but we're going to get that and put it onto the spreadsheet. So you can ask you your question. Like it should be my personal assistant, real assistant, not assistant that I'm telling you to do. It should be doing on my behalf. And yeah. So, so we're talking about that. Um, Imagine if you know what Gary said became true across the board, right? Yeah. He runs Windows. The Copilot shows up now. He can speak to it in whatever broken commands he comes up with. And right. it does its best to interpret what he's asking for and to make it happen. And that's yeah. exactly what the Rabbit device is trying to do, right? It's mm -hmm. push the talk, you know, okay, kind of a walkie-talkie interface. And I right. say random things to it. And it tries to run the right apps in the right way to achieve my goals and report back to me. If it succeeds... I don't care if it's an Android app or a Chrome app or a native desktop app. You can exactly. throw all that UI history in the garbage can. Mm -hmm. I just, I just want the actions to happen. Exactly. No, that's true. That's what I want. I want it to be my assistant and actually or do work for me. That uh, is a let's radical go. approach. I mean, those guys are way out in front. They're, they're sweeping the leg. No mercy. Yes. Um, and I don't see anything like that out of Google or Sundar over the last nine years. No, it isn't. They're just, just trying to catch uh, catch up. Um, that being said, uh, people lost their jobs. We're really sorry about it. Um, and we just want you to hopefully take the advice here to help you out. And if there's anything I can do, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, but make sure to make it easy so I can just cut and paste stuff. Uh, <laughs> Apple, co Apple so I'm quite lazy. Uh, you can see by the Well, the shed's clean now, which is nice. Um, Apple quietly launched an open source multimodal LLM oh, called yeah. Ferret. So, Joe, you we were... You're talking a lot about this, Joe. So let's talk, tell, give us a breakdown here. What's going on with Ferret? Yeah, so there's a couple of interesting things going on. Uh, and, and Apple basically published two papers recently for very different ideas, but both basically talking about the same uh, project. One of them is about this Ferret model and its capabilities. It's basically a, a multimodal kind of model. You can give it 
images, you can give it text and it can work with both. It knows how to do things um, like Facebook segment anything model where it can identify objects in an image. It can work with bounding boxes. It can work with arbitrary sort of region shapes or points on things. So it's very flexible. Uh, it works with images and language, like I said. And then the second paper and the second line of research is, okay, we've got this fairly large uh, multimodal and language model. How do we run it on a limited device like, I don't know, an iPhone? And there they talk about how they're going to swap the weights of the model and its activations in and out of flash, uh, in and out of main memory, that is, in a sort of paging scheme. But anyway, the upshot is this approach lets them run a much larger model on a less capable device, at least less capable than we expected would run such a large model. So what that says to me is sometime in the near future, you should expect uh, iPhones and, and iPads and so on to be running a fairly powerful multimodal model and for the features of that model to show up in a bunch of Apple products. That would be fantastic. Um, and do they, and you, well, you say you, you feel that they're going to do it. And, and so you think maybe for the next iPhone launch, there's a possibility they might have something in there. Yeah. I mean, these papers are describing their results, which is kind of backwards, right? Normally Apple's quiet about this stuff, but I think, Maybe this is also part of a marketing program to sort of show that Apple is in this game, that they're not just, uh, you know, out of it completely because people are saying, well, you know, is Apple going to catch up? Are they sort of behind? So, yeah. so maybe they're publishing the research. I would normally expect Apple to just be completely quiet about it, not communicate anything until the product announcement. Right. No, that, that makes sense. They're usually you're very cloak and dagger. So I'm thinking here, yeah. maybe this is a sign that they're realizing we're way falling behind. We got to show Wall Street we're doing something. Mm -hmm. And also they quietly are like, oh yeah, the Vision Pro is $3,500. No one cares. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Like, no one cares. I get nerd Nobody glasses, cares. big headset, makes people dizzy. It's not, it's not ready. I want holodeck. I want to just ah. click something on and the, it adapts to me and I'm not adapting to that shit. I know your marginal steps, yes. I still think VR is fantastic for gaming. I've seen some games where you're in the X-Wing and you're looking around in a, in a dog fight and you can see everything around or horror games. Fantastic. But I putting that shit on my head on a regular, <laughs> not happening. Like you already see how big my head is. It is like, it's just not good. You don't want to wear the goggles. No, I don't want to freaking goggles. Hell no. I wasn't even wearing the Google glass. Google glass was like, all right. It's like, you're like announcing everyone virgin alert, virgin alert. Like when you're walking around. With that are you saying those <laughs> goggles are a prophylactic? Exactly. Pretty much. I mean, it's a good, Aaron that's the Jean, best. You won't be having sex with anyone. They should have called it the, pro they should have called it promise ring. <laughs> I think promise that, glasses. Uh, <laughs> I think we could safely put this in your predictions list. I mean, you already said Sundar is going to, going to no longer be the CEO of, yeah. of Google, right? This year. Yeah. Is that sometime in 2024 that's going to happen? Yes, yeah, sometime in 2024. Um, All right. And I then feel your second gonna... prediction is sometime in 2024, uh, Apple starts shipping multimodal <sighs> and large language model features in their devices. I don't feel that strong on that one. Uh, I, nope. I, 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 what right. do you think? I think that's a safe bet. Okay. That's yours. Um, that makes At sense. At any rate, the first paper in this series is yeah. uh, this ferret. The okay. title is Ferret, Refer and Ground Anything, Anywhere, at Any Granularity. That's the mm -hmm. name of the paper. Uh, it's in our list, and so it'll, it'll get pushed to the newsletter. Yeah, uh, if you're patreon.com patreon forward slash fic, if you're a supporter, yep. for five bucks a month, you get access to our updates of our newsletter. The second uh, paper, the sort of companion to that one, is the one about squeezing the model onto, onto smaller devices using this kind of swapping technique. And I like that. Do you want to go into that? Yeah, I sort of mentioned it before, but the yeah. idea is the weights and the activations are too large to keep in uh, their version of GPU high availability memory or high access speed memory. Uh, so what they do is they swap it out to flash memory, which they have a lot of in these devices. They use flash for sort of persistent storage. And then they page in the chunks that they need in a kind of anticipatory way, sort of trying to bring them in because there's a latency when you ask to bring them in. Right. Um, so they try and bring them in in anticipation of needing those parts of the model. Yep. Uh, and then they're watching the execution of the model and trying to decide which parts they're going to need at, at what point in time. Anyway, the upshot is they
they can run a model that's much bigger than people would have predicted on that device. Nice. That's, that's, the, is it is that considered a novel technique or if anyone has anyone tried first it time I've, I've seen anyone, uh, I mean, people have thought about how we're going to do this, but it's the first time I've seen anyone really do the details and actually, uh, implement it. Uh, and I'll be reading that paper and adding it to the list. Great. And do they talk about performance? Like how much battery is they do? Using? They give a bunch like, of stats. That's always the, f okay. They give a bunch of stats on how fast they're able to run the model and how large of a model they're able to run given the memory of the device. Uh, they, I don't believe they talk about battery life, um, but I would actually assume their battery life won't be the key problem. I think a bigger problem will be what else is going on at that device at the same time while it's mm. trying to run this model, right? Because normally a, a, a mobile phone is doing many things at once uh, even though the user is only focused on the front most application and then to have a language model running in the background and consuming a lot of the resources will be interesting. Yeah. And I'm thinking about like the cross collaboration between this team that's trying to get these models miniaturized on the iPhone mm -hmm. and then the other iPhone teams that own different apps mm -hmm. and trying to be like, Hey, like you're not leading the show anymore. That's always, that's a tough conversation because uh, someone's got to come in and be the Steve Jobs and saying, okay, I'm restructuring it. This is the vision. You have to fall in line. And we saw that with started with Bing chat and now it's, nope, sorry, Bing, you're just a tool to co-pilot right. and you're getting absorbed. Sorry, that's the way it is. You've been, so, you've been subsumed. And you also remember that uh, Andre Carpathy gave a really good talk about allocating resources to the large uh, model they were using in Tesla's because the hardware for the Tesla is already, you know, shipped to like thousands of car owners. And they're trying to build this self driving model that has to run inside that fixed hardware arrangement. Yeah. And so he had to build a allocation uh, scheme for how much resource was going to be given to different parts of the model because all the different teams involved all wanted you know, they wanted their part to run really well. And so you got to parcel out the hardware because the system runs in real time, right? Exactly. And that was the whole argument of like, a lot of people at Google are like, if self-driving cars have LiDAR, everyone's going to die. <laughs> and, and, and then you, the, Andre's like, yep, it'd be great to have it, but there is a th power trade-offs and performance trade-offs and is the marginal gain in safety worth maybe the additional power drain on the car or something else like that. So that's always a tough about miniaturizing these models and getting things to run on, on a laptop, on a laptop or a cell phone. It's like a spaceship. It's like, I, I hope everyone here is, please tell me in chat. You've seen Apollo 13. Apollo 13 is one of my favorite space movies. And there's this famous scene where I guess what they all, Joe knows it better than I do. Cause you're a Mensa, but like, I guess the oxygen tank explodes because they're trying to stir the tanks or something. And then they show the scene in Mission Control where they get all the NASA engineers together and they throw all this crap on the table and they're like, all right, we have like a flashlight left of, of energy and we have all these tools here. How do we get these people back to a, ho a home safe? And mm -hmm. that was like scorched into my mind of like that's kind of what it's like for any other product that you're trying to ship that's not attached by a power cord or directly connected with mm. an Ethernet cable. So, Well, also, you know, like in the case of these cars, they're fairly expensive and they have – uh, a long lifespan right before mm -hmm. they get replaced. Yeah. Uh, it's not the same as, you know, I'm selling laptops where I can just ask people to upgrade their laptop to run some application. Right. Right. Like if you think of the, the old, the old days of productivity apps, if someone wanted to run Excel on a much larger uh, spreadsheet model, or they wanted to edit much larger images in Photoshop, they would just go buy a beefier laptop or even a beefier desktop. Mm -hmm. Right. But you can't tell people to do that to run new software in a Tesla. Exactly. It's so true. You can't say, hey, um, we have new stuff coming out. So if you could just like, you know, sell the car you bought for 60000 and go buy a new one for eighty, like that would be really great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, great. Uh, so do you want to – actually, let's do a quick question. And then for our next episode, we're going to jump, jump even deeper into, into research. Sorry, y'all. Mm -hmm. um, Question, uh, do you, this is from uh, uh, Augmentix. He says, uh, do you think that AI technology is running ahead of commercial AI adoption and integration? How can a small, medium-sized business add AI to their workflows today? Who are they going to call? 
Ghostbusters. Do, do, right. do, 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 do. Where are the exactly? Where are the integrators? Ex- something strange in your neighborhood. Neighborhood, and also I will say. They did the Ghostbusters remake where they're like, all right, we're going to oh, put politics into it. And it was terrible. But they made a newer one where they're like, you know what we're going to do? We'll go back to the traditional story and make it focus on kids and make it that this, this Fieldberg sp- feel and just be more traditional and not like say we no, hate I think the I think once, once you make a sequel and you blow the franchise, you don't deserve another chance. No, that's very, that's very fair. Anyways, I think I, the fans I, just boycott from then on. Well, I'm completely off the of Star Wars wagon, but I've – they saw the last Ghostbusters with the the girl who's leading it and everything, and she's with the other kids and everything. You know, it turned out to be good. But I will, I agree with you. Also, many firms will still be monitoring the AI situation, so any adoption won't happen for some time. So, do you think AI technology is running ahead of commercial AI adoption and integration? Mm-hmm. How absolutely. can small medium businesses? So, absolutely, that Joe. And your thoughts? I mean, there's so much that could be done, and enterprises are so far behind in adopting it. And you described this well in, uh, I think, the previous episode. Uh, they tend to be very conservative. They're much more fear-driven. They're much more worried about what can go wrong than what can go right. So it's much more likely that a small startup company will adopt these ideas first. And the larger enterprises will only adopt these ideas when they're forced to because they're losing customers to some startup. Exactly. And it, it's, it's, it's terrible. And the executives don't have the incentive to take the risk to do this. Um, mm-hmm. It's very uh, asymmetrical. It's like, yeah, we could, you could do this and it can improve things, but the risk of it blowing up is my career and I'm not going to, I'm not going to own that. Um, and has this been similar to other technology cycles you've seen where there's been like new technological breakthroughs and companies have just been like, meh. We're gonna stay with we're gonna stay with steam power instead of electricity. I mean, no, we're gonna stay with not using the internet. The internet's too risky. We're not gonna give everyone internet access. It's gonna destroy our company. Yeah, and we we've lived through several of these. I mean, there was a time when you had to get on the the local network in order to do anything at a company, right? Remember the whole VPN thing? You had to like log into the VPN and then log into the application. And I'm still I remember I'm it still was doing a radical. That. Oh, well, there you go. It was a radical move when Google said, you know, hey, we're going to do this open thing where you can be at home and log into your Google account and see your apps. Right. Mm-hmm. And the Google uh, IT organization was way out in front in implementing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's another example. A lot of companies are still lagging behind, still having their their employees do all kinds of weirdness. Another example I still have to put weird digits and punctuation at the end of my password on several websites. It's like, for God's sakes, the research has been done. It's well understood that putting punctuation and digits at the end of your password does not improve the security. Stop doing that. There's oh, much better ways to help people create unique passwords or to do two and three factor authentication where the strength of the password is not your only problem. And yet, Still, people want you to put some punctuation in your damn password. Okay, let's talk about one. Everyone should have two-factor authentication. What's three-factor authentication? Just adding something in addition, like you can watch how I type and try to use the, the timing of the movements as a signature. You can do face recognition. You can do a fingerprint. There's all these other ways to add something that in addition to a password and a one-time code lets me log into an account. Awesome. Uh, another example is you could use proximity of other devices. You know that I have a phone, I have a laptop, maybe I have a watch or a ring, and that if two or three of those devices are together in one place at one time when I try to log in, it's probably me. Yeah. I like the ring idea. That's fantastic. And I tell people, at least I tell everyone, because I'm on Facebook and I'll see people's grandparents have gotten their accounts hacked. And I'm like, please get the two auth. Like immediately get her on two auth. Get grandma on two auth, please. Um, right. Also, I mean, the- the classic there is, you know, something you know, like a password, something you are, like a fingerprint or face recognition, mm-hmm. and something you have, like a separate ring or, a, you know, a token or something. I love that. Um, let's talk about, there was a research paper that came out like a couple months ago, and it was like, not research paper, there was like the, the founder who said that you, the person who created the research saying you should change your password every six months came out and said, actually, that's a bunch of malarkey. It actually causes more problems than anything else because people then start writing their yes. password everywhere. And yes. no one in large enterprises changed anything. And you know why I thought? Because 
those VPs are only the only type of job for VP of security. And it's a lot of work, but you are the fall person for the CEO anytime mm -hmm. a major security blow happens. And I think, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, when Uber, remember when Uber got their Slack hijacked and some, some edgy, the person who broke into their Slack went to like announcements all, I was like, hi, I have currently hijacked your company Slack. Mm -hmm. And he didn't use, uh, he didn't use, I forget, the, the blast everyone. He used something more politely, like here. <laughs> and we're like, oh, he's so polite. What a polite hacker. And he was like, please mm -hmm. get in contact with me for negotiation of terms. And yep. I can imagine the secure, the VP of engineering was like, okay, or security is like, all right, I guess I don't have a job anymore. Talk to you later. Um, <laughs> so it's always that fear. So anyways, um, back to the question, how can a small, medium sized business add AI to their workflows mm. today? Maybe I'll take a crack, Joe, and just, uh, annihilate me. So first, we have a good friend of mine named Ali. He's a product manager. He used to work at Google. Really, really good dude. He said, to train yourself to use these language models, what you should start doing is when you're working, think of things you don't like doing. And before you do it, open up ChatGPT and see if it can do it for you. That's like step one. Mm -hmm. And you're going to start saying, oh, wow, like there's a good component of my work that this thing could do. Um, or there's some things that it could do, but you're going to need to get more fancy the GPT or something else like that. So step one is just train yourself to use it. And mm -hmm. then step two is once you start using it more, start working on your prompts, craft better prompts, get clearer in your thinking, um, see if the output is what you want on a regular basis. Once you then get to that level, then you can say, do I want to go hardcore and maybe have it write a script so it could then through Python and or Google Apps Script, not Apps Script, Python. So it can call GPT Force API and then do it for me by a click of the button instead of me going to Chat GPT every time. Now yep. here's the rub: uh, OpenAI is moving so quickly now that scripts that I had written on Python mm -hmm. to call uh, the GPT Four API to do note summarization and then kick it out into a, a doc for me. I've now basically are starting to get absorbed by chat GPT itself. So it mm. is like progressing as time goes on. So what I tell people who are not engineers and your small businesses, before you commit to, ah, oh, I think I'm going to go hire someone at Upwork to like write a code for me or something customly tailored. I would say, are you fully using the product with the features it has to its full extent of its capability? And are you a hundred percent certain one? If you're 100% certain that you are and you're not getting what you want, two, then look into what's the product roadmap? Like, where do we think this thing is going going forward? And then if your next set question is, should I either pay to get someone to build a custom hack or maybe you just go get a subscription to another SaaS product for like 10 bucks that calls ChatGPT but does all these different things for me? I say go for the latter. As mm -hmm. soon as you write code, the moment it is sent to you and it works, it's already out of date. <laughs> There's already <laughs> things changing and you're going to be paying so much more time and mental headache trying to get someone to be like, Hey Joe, uh, can I pay you X million to update this decrepit, terrible stack? And Joe's like, yeah, I'll, I'll take your money. But like, there's a product down the street for nine bucks a month that's doing all this already. Yeah. So um, follow those guidelines. One, uh, just things you hate working to do. Go to ChatGP first to do it. Work on crafting better prompts. Um, look at chat, uh, chat GPT and features you're trying to release. See if there's other companies that are built on top of it and can give you more functionality than you already have. And I think that should take care of like most folks. And then as far as like, I want to do custom integrations, things like that, you better have a very strong use case of something that you're going to do. That's going to be saving you a massive amount of time or making a lot of money before you get into the situation. I'm going to have a custom coded solution built. Anyways, mm. that's my that's my thought, Joe. But you're the true engineer here. I'd love to hear what you say. No, I like all those descriptions uh, and ideas. I think most of the stuff you're describing, I would characterize as how do I improve my own internal processes by using these new um, models and new products. And I would say, yeah, there's a whole bunch of startups that are trying to expose those models and put them into use cases that are valuable and they're and they're competing right now and they have investment right now. So they're very cheap and you can use them and try them out, you know, and decide which ones are, are really working for you. So I'm, I'm on board for all that. The other thing I would say is that outside of your company, uh, ordinary people who might be your customers, uh, you know, are interested in trying out things like GPTs. So you could go over to 
the open AI and, and the new uh, GPT store, you could create a GPT that makes use of your product or that connects to it in some interesting way and then brand it, you know, put your company's name on it and put it in the store because it's free publicity. I mean, if it does something useful and guides that person to using your business for more, you know, it's a free lead. So it doesn't necessarily even have to raise you any money or, or you don't have to get paid for it if it just brings you more customers. So I would put that in a second category of how can you do things outside your company potentially for your customers? Uh, that's perfect. Well said. Well, Joe, um, uh, I think it says last thing it says, um, also many firms will still be monitoring the AI situation. So any adoption won't happen for some time. Where are the integrators, et cetera, we need to get this thing moving forward? Um, I, we answered this probably in our last podcast episode explaining there's just a lot of internal bureaucracy and bloat in organizations that prevent change from happening. Like, there, And there are people in these organizations who are trying to like, let's push things forward. God bless them. But a lot of it's just the way things work in, in large companies. And you also sometimes need people to attrit out of organizations so new people can move up with new ideas to make progress happen. Hmm. Um, I, I, I think right now, like I mentioned before, if we just stopped progress right now in all LMs and just left them at current state and only had GPT 3.5 and 4, if companies were fully integrating this stuff, oh my God, like the productivity gains would be massive. So hmm. it's not the tech not being ready right now. It's just the bureaucracy and the people are not ready for this to happen. Um, well, and we're also seeing smaller competitors make use of these models or similar models in really different ways, right? Like mm -hmm. going back to the rabbit thing. That's a crazy new approach. Uh, yeah. And we saw, we saw a hint of this in the model that Adept did, the A, ADT1, I forget the name of it, action, right. basically it was an action model. Um, but the idea was already there. You just didn't see anyone wrapping it up in a product the way that the rabbit guys did. Exactly. No, it's totally true. And if you all want to learn about rabbit we have a video right here that you should click and link and watch it's like super duper good we go into rabbit and the different technology and whatnot um mm -hmm. so check that out uh don't forget to like subscribe and share and please support us on patreon.com forward slash svic you pay 10 bucks a month to get our newsletter and you can ask joe and i questions and we can answer business questions investing questions finance peace talk to you later bye